Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. David, welcome to the digital podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you. Can you start by introducing yourself, um, your career so far, your current role at the Society of uh, Model Manufacturers and Traders? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm David Wong, and I'm Head of Technology and Innovation uh, at the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, SMMT. Uh, SMMT is the UK's automotive industry body, representing the sum total of UK automotive, and that means all major vehicle manufacturers, automotive component suppliers, engineering and technology firms, uh, the aftermarket, as well as mobility and auto tech uh, startups. So you can see we are, we are quite a broad church. And uh, we've been uh, in existence since 1902, so a long time, actually 121 years and, and counting. Uh, we are the voice of UK Automotive, and my role uh, is to look at the uh, technology and innovation side of the industry and support the industry in advancing these technologies, and particularly electric vehicles, connected and automated vehicles, hydrogen mobility, uh, and also anything that's got to do with digital and uh, mobility uh, innovation uh, more broadly. Great. Thank you for that introduction. So. Um, I want to start our discussion with the topic of connected and automated uh, vehicles. I think it's in everyone's mind these days, right? And uh, with the transportation infrastructure being digitalized to the point where you have vehicle communicating with the infrastructure, but also to other vehicles. And obviously there's connections to uh, smart city applications and smart home applications, right? There's so many things going on. Um, but this connectivity and communication of data has accelerated um, innovation, right? Not only in the automotive uh, sector, but more broadly in mobility services. So mm -hmm. as an opening to our discussion, can you describe some of the latest technological innovations in this connected and automated uh, space? Yes, absolutely. So it's very important, first of all, to understand the difference between connectivity and automation, although we tend to say connected and automated vehicles in one breath, um, but effectively what is connected refers basically to vehicles that are connected or able to communicate externally. And that is either with a network, which means vehicle to network or vehicle to cloud. And it's something that we understand today. And this is basically long range communication so a vehicle that is, for example, has a SIM card in it and therefore is able to communicate externally with the cloud, with the network or some other external sources via the UU network, uh, maybe a little bit technical, but that's the long range communication network. Or we could also be talking about short range communication, which is basically vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure. Now, of course, if you talk about this from a telecoms industry perspective. Uh, some of our colleagues in the telecom sector may also throw in vehicle to pedestrian, for example, and that means vehicle to the phone. Yeah, but principally, we are talking about vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to uh, infrastructure, short range communication. Now that is connectivity or connected vehicles. And then you have automated vehicles or in simple terms in the UK, we call it self-driving vehicles, but they, they mean the same thing. So automated vehicles are vehicles that are able to drive themselves, safely drive themselves in some circumstances or situations in public roads or public spaces, as well as potentially also in off-road situations without the need for human input. And what that means is that there is no need for the human to monitor the vehicle, the way the vehicle drives or the external environment. And there's no need for the human being to control the vehicle. In simple terms, there's no need to steer, there's no need to brake, and no need to accelerate. If the vehicle can do all these things, then it is an automated vehicle, right? So put together, that's what we call connected and automated vehicles. And it is when the two come together that we start to have this term called connected and automated mobility which refers to the applications and the services that could be spawned 
by the technology. And when I say technology, that's the connectivity and the, the automation. When you put together, you've got the services and the applications. And of course, we can talk a little bit uh, um, uh, deeper about these applications and services um, uh, in, in, this, in this podcast. But suffice to say that with the spawning of these new applications and services, there are a lot of economic gains that can be created. And actually, we published a report um, um, very recently to show that if there are connected and automated vehicles on the road in substantial numbers in the UK by 2040, the annual economic gain to the UK could be as high as 66 billion pounds. Wow. Wow. And, and I, we will be providing links to those reports at the bottom of the podcast, of course, uh, before going into the details of all these different technologies. Uh, and I'm particularly interested also in automated cars. Maybe you could also say a little bit about the types of mobility services that are available. So this is not just cars. It's also, I guess, scooters and electric bikes and uh, all sorts of other things, right? Maybe just to mention a few and then uh, we can go deeper. Um, at the lowest level, you've got micro mobility, um, and increasingly they're electrically uh, uh, propelled. Um, but nonetheless, these are the likes of um, electric scooters, kick scooters, electric scooters, um, um, pedal bikes or electric bikes, and then you've got cargo bikes if it's for delivery uh, of, of goods, for example. Um, and then when you move on then to um, uh, L category vehicles, some of these actually mount pavements. This could be some uh, three wheelers, for example, um, and some of these could mount uh, pavements. They are not necessarily considered as proper road going uh, vehicles. Yeah, and some of these are also meant for uh, delivery of goods. And then we come to the light duty road going vehicles. Whether they are connected, automated, or not, these are the likes of obviously ordinary passenger cars. It could be uh, light duty uh, vans uh, as well, so commercial um, vehicles. Then we come to the heavy duty vehicles, which are principally commercial vehicles, where these are obviously the, um, the, the trailers and, and trucks, uh, the heavy goods vehicles, refuse trucks, buses and coaches. We know that these are the heaviest vehicles um, um, available on the road. And that's there's another segment that's often ignored, but that's equally important. And this is the off-road segment, which means these vehicles don't ply the ordinary roads in, in the UK, of which there are 247,000 uh, miles. So we are talking about, for example, the vehicles that are used um, in factories, ports, airports, agriculture, farmland, or quarries for, uh, for mining uh, purposes. So there are different categories of vehicles, all of them could potentially be connected as well as fitted with automated driving technology. So they could be self-driving and they could serve certain purposes. And again, we could delve into this a little bit um, um, later in, in this conversation, because I think there are quite a lot of opportunities in many of these sectors for technology to be fitted and you could see the efficiency gains. I, I'm really excited about this. I mean, I've, I've spoken to various people. Um, uh, last week, I was talking to the CIO of Mac Airports, and we were talking about the importance of um, various types of vehicles used in the airport and the various types of automation technologies that are uh, used there. So as you said, there's, it's a large space. It's not just uh, passenger uh, vehicles, and that that's why I wanted us to clarify the, the various categories mm. uh, of mobility and the possibilities that there are uh, these these vehicles could be automated and connected. So the types of innovations that are coming forward um, and the, the, the way that we now uh, think about mobility as uh, moving above and beyond passenger um, uh, vehicles. Um, can we talk about a shift in the business models of auto manufacturers, the original equipment manufacturers from, you know, this traditional vertical integrated supply chain to what are now referred to as digital platform ecosystems? Because obviously mm -hmm. the, the types of services that you can build on top uh, of the vehicles themselves uh, the sky's the limit, right? So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. given that, is there a shift 
and is this being acknowledged by the OEMs themselves? Yeah, I think it's easiest probably to approach this subject from uh, the perspective of a contextual preface. Yeah, so what we've been talking about um, within the industry for the past uh, five to seven years is this concept of ACES, A C E S, ACES, and it's an acronym that stands for automated connected, electrified, and in the early days, the S stood for shared mobility. But after the pandemic, the S has been recalibrated slightly, and it's probably more appropriate to say services, uh, which is basically a term that is very appropriate because services are increasingly spawned by the previous three letters, automation, connectivity, and electrification. Now, I think it's... um. Self-explanatory, what's automation? Because I mentioned about automated vehicles. Um, not there yet. There are no, just to, just to be clear uh, to your um, um, audience, at the moment, there are no commercially deployed automated vehicles on British roads. There are plenty running around um, uh, in trials and, and, and testing, but no commercially deployed automated vehicles yet. There are some uh, in America, but not uh, in, the, in the UK. In terms of connectivity, that's exactly what I mentioned just now, vehicle to network or vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure connectivity. The former is already available, long time available. Cars are equipped with SIM card and can actually communicate to the network. And obviously for a lot of the uh, new cars today, you've got Wi-Fi hotspot within the vehicle uh, itself. So connected vehicles are a, a mainstay. It's a norm today. And then, of course, you need not um, 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 interrogate any further about electrification, obviously, because we know that it's going to happen. It will happen. It definitely will be um, the uh, the direction of uh, travel, given that government has announced the end of sale of internal combustion engine uh, vehicles for 2035. So the future is going to be automated, connected, and electrified. But because of these three elements, you get the service element. And increasingly, what we are seeing is that digitalization coupled with automation, connectivity, and electrification have given rise to the opportunity to embed services onto vehicle manufacturers' platforms. And I call this, perhaps slightly academic term, I call this horizontalization. And you know, I mean, going back to days uh, when we were together in Cambridge, Pano, as you may remember, right? Some 20 years ago, we have a phone. And what did the phone do? Principally is for us to make calls. Principally. There are a few other things it could do at that time, but principally to make calls. And then with the advent of smartphones, overnight, you get that platform, that digital platform that is a smartphone, integrating quite a number of previously disparate verticals. For example, now previously, so you cast our minds back 20 years ago, if we wanted a set nav, what did we do? We went out there and bought a Garmin or a TomTom, -tom, right? And stick it into a vehicle. Yeah, we've got a set nav. Or if we're a little bit less digitally inclined, we may be actually looking at the, um, the road atlas. Um, hopefully, while, um, um, uh, while we're driving, someone is doing that for us and, and not, um, uh, not that we did it ourselves. And today, We've got a set nav on the smartphone. And similarly, we used to have to, maybe we still do, um, look at the time by looking at, um, um, at, at our watches. But obviously today you can get everything on the smartphone. And we used to watch uh, videos um, um, either on a, on, a, on, a, on a VHS player, DVD player. Um, but of course, everything is streamed now, potentially also onto your smartphone rather than just uh, your larger uh, screen. So what I'm trying to say is that the smartphone itself as a platform has horizontalized across so many verticals. And that's what's happening now in automotive. With the smart car, and thanks to digitalization and software-defined vehicles, uh, apologies for another uh, technical term, uh, but because of software-defined vehicles, we increasingly see a number of new services could be integrated into the vehicle manufacturer's platform. And of course, new business models could be spawned. Example, 
And you could, as I, as I give this example, um, you could try to detect how many verticals it has actually crisscrossed, yeah? So I could actually start driving uh, my car to, let's say, uh, a business meeting. Um, and often these days, I will actually set the destination on the set nav on my phone. And when I get into the car, there's integration between my phone and the car uh, operating system, and the set nav location will instantly be displayed to me, right? The car knows where I'm going. Now, maybe I was in a hurry, so I didn't have time to actually book a spot for charging my vehicle at my destination. I, haven't, I hadn't got time to do it on my phone. So I got to do it mid-flight. As I'm driving through voice control, I can tell my car to actually, because it, it knows where I'm going, it's got a set nav, right? Uh, it knows my destination, to book the nearest available parking space with a charger. And I can specify, I might actually want a 7.4 kilowatt charger or perhaps a 22 kilowatt charger if I'm not staying there for very long. Right. So and the car immediately works out how much charge I need based on how much battery left when I arrive um, um, at the um, at the destination. So it books for me and I've got a spot reserved. When I get to my destination, I just plug in and the car could actually perform a handshake with the charging station. And I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to tap an RFID card. I didn't have to download an app and scan it because the car could already do that. And we have that technology today. It's called plug-in charge, by the way. And then I go to my meeting. And once I'm done my meeting, I get my car. I just unplug and off I go. I didn't even have to tap my contactless credit card because there was already the digital handshake, right? Just at this juncture, a short pause. You can see there are a few um, verticals that have been crossed through digitalization. And one of them is parking, another charging, and yet another payment. So three verticals have been integrated into one um, uh, journey. There. Now I got my car back and then on my way back, right, um, uh, my car has my calendar because it's synced to my phone and it's telling me and reminding me while I'm driving, again through voice, so that I don't have to take my eyes off the road, it's reminding me actually that my car is due for servicing next week. And it's offering me some options, whether I want to book servicing online while I'm driving and the car will perform that, or whether I prefer to do it myself manually when I get home. And if I say, yeah, please book servicing for me, and then it gives me options as to whether I want to bring it to my usual uh, um, franchise dealer or another um, uh, dealer within the same network or anywhere that I'd like, potentially even the aftermarket, right? Then I would actually select the option. You would book the um, um, servicing uh, for me. And then interestingly, as I'm driving, it reminds me that in real time that actually milk is running low in my fridge. So then what's, why milk running low? Because I've got a smart fridge at home that could detect the volume of the, um, the, uh, the contents inside the, um, the fridge. So it gave me the option whether I wanted to stop by the supermarket on my way home so that my set nav could be rerouted and for me to pick up a bottle of milk. And of course, I could decline that, particularly if I know that tomorrow there's a delivery uh, to my home. But if I'm desperate for milk, I'll say, yes, please reroute me and please order um, a, um, a bottle of um, milk. So what I do is that when I get to the supermarket, there is a McDonald's drive through style pickup point where I don't even have to get out of the car. I just wind my window down, get a bottle of milk handed to me and off I go. And I didn't even have to tap my cart to pay. Again, because of that handshake, that digital handshake between my car platform, who has my bank account details, and that retailer, i.e. the supermarket, and my bank. And off I go. And then about a mile before I arrive home, the car would automatically uh, tell uh, my uh, heating system to turn on the heating, preset to the temperature that, um, that, um, uh, that is my preference. And about, say, uh, 500 yards to my home, it will tell the front lights at the porch to turn on and the automatic gate to, uh, to prepare to open as I approach uh, the driveway. And once I'm home, I'll plug in to charge 
overnight, and the car will communicate with the grid, knowing exactly when is the time that I should that my car should actually take charge. And that is basically to take advantage of the low electricity tariffs overnight. And this is usually between 12.30 in the morning to about 4.30, right? Um, if need be, I've also given the preset uh, instructions to my car to give some electricity back to the grid if there is a temporary spike in electricity uh, power usage within my local area, knowing that I will get my money back when I give something back to the grid, and that's vehicle-to-grid technology. So this is a simple example actually has crisscrossed quite a number of verticals. From where I stopped just now, you could tell that a number of verticals have been crisscrossed. Servicing, the servicing industry, all the way through to supermarket that's retailing. Again, that's banking and payments. And then you've got smart home with, uh, with the heating system and smart gates, smart home infrastructure, IoT. And lastly, the energy sector because of the integration with electric vehicles. And all these are actually managed by the platform that is enabled by the vehicle. Now, of course, you could say that it could also be done on your phone. And that's where basically vehicle and phone integration comes into play. It's software defined, it's enabled by digitalization. And you can just imagine how many partnerships could be spawned and new business models that horizontalizes across all these verticals when previously all you do while you were driving is you just drove your vehicle. And now with your vehicle, you go, you can do more than just driving and you could avail yourselves to all these services. Yeah. And what's impressive also um, is that in addition to that, you're no longer using your mobile phone manually with your hands. You're giving uh, instructions by voice and you know, your, your uh, mobile phone then connects to the car, communicates with the car, the car communicates with other uh, technologies surrounding the car, uh, as you mentioned, so many different verticals. So it could actually also impact safety in addition to all the other things that you mentioned, all the benefits that the various partnerships bring by using this digital platform. And of course, uh, you made a pertinent point there, Panos, uh, that uh, we're not using we're not using handheld devices while we are driving, right? Yeah. And that's of course in the current context. Um, all, all that well, I mentioned just now, all those examples within um, um, that, that wider uh, um, um, use case, um, um, are basically predicated on connected vehicle services enabled by digitalization and software rather than automated vehicles because when the time comes we can actually ride in an automated vehicle yes we can use our handheld devices but we're not there yet <laughs> yeah so a little bit of caution there for the audience um, but i want to maybe go a little bit deeper on this point of shifting business models um, and obviously there's a lot of benefits to be gained um, but in addition to that, there's, there are new technology companies that are entering this space, right? So uh, Intel, NVIDIA, Google, and a number of other companies that are very much interested in automated um, and connected cars, um, you know, the, the likes of Cruise and Waymo. So what is interesting is that there are strong interdependencies between these OEM and mm. these uh, big tech companies um, in that on the one hand, the OEMs do not have the capabilities to uh, store data, the compute capabilities, the, the, the processor chips, et cetera, et cetera, the cloud technologies. But on the other hand, the big tech companies don't have the capabilities to manufacture cars. Mm. So the two, there, there, there are strong complementarities between the two. Um, and there are obviously disruptive opportunities here. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about, on the one hand, the types of complementarities that are emerging there and, and the innovative technologies that are coming forward. But on the other hand, how this is disrupting some traditional uh, business boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly see much more um, opportunities for partnerships than actually uh, much more uh, disruption 
from the rise uh, of um, new players within the ecosystem. So all those um, uh, tech companies that you mentioned are firmly embedded in partnerships with quite a number of vehicle uh, manufacturers. Now, obviously, uh, because they are competitors to a large extent, uh, those tech companies that you mentioned, so they're competitors to a large extent. Um, so a vehicle manufacturer would usually be in partnership with one or the other, rather than uh, rather than both. Right? So, um, because of the need for next generation compute systems, they're obviously not just power hungry, but also able to do quite a number of things, and it will enable. In the past, we say IoT, but increasingly AI. Uh, so we are looking at these partnerships uh, being formed between uh, vehicle manufacturer, their traditional tier one supplier, and increasingly these tech companies that provide the, uh, the platform, the power electronics, as well as the compute platform to build quite a number of these new functionalities and capabilities, particularly assisted driving systems and in the future, automated driving uh, systems. Um, so that um, that is already happening. Those partnerships are happening. The second bit that you mentioned is about um, disruption. The greatest, single greatest disruption is in the area of electrification rather than necessarily in the area of digitalization or connected and automated um, vehicles. And let me explain why. Because when we talk about electrification, we are talking about doing away with a technology that has been developed and refined for over a century, originating obviously in, in Europe. And that's the internal combustion engine, which is complex, which is why it's been refined for so many decades. And we're still refining it, actually. You know, the, 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 the newest internal combustion engines are the cleanest, um, and you would expect so. However, because when we're talking about electric vehicles, we are starting to talk about fewer components, fewer moving parts within a vehicle, because you have principally the battery, and you have the motors, the inverters, and then you have the drivetrain, the electric drivetrain. And it is about one seventh in terms of the number of components that you would find in an internal combustion engine vehicle. So it's less complex. And as such, what it means is it's easier for new kids on the block to come into the picture and develop their own electric vehicles. I suppose in academic speak, we could say that the barriers to entry have become lower as a result of electrification technologies. And this is not to say that electrification is, uh, is an easy game because it's really difficult to manufacture vehicles as some uh, startups in the EV space uh, have discovered um, because quite a lot of them have run into financial difficulties. While it may be easy to produce, um, e relatively easier to produce a drivetrain and integrate the battery pack to actually achieve scale production of the vehicles at a level that is slick and a level where you can actually make money is really quite difficult. Yeah. But nonetheless, it does provide the opportunity for disruptors to enter the game and give the incumbents a run for their money. And of course, these disruptors and new kids on the block or startups um, could be found anywhere in the world because obviously the simplification of producing a vehicle that hasn't got an internal combustion engine um, has allowed uh, for any of these uh, startups uh, to learn the trade very quickly. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because what disruption means is that it is actually spurring the incumbents to up their game. And the incumbents, the vehicle manufacturers that have been around for decades, if not some of them, a century, have actually learned to refine the processes involved in actually making a vehicle. And I mentioned this now, it is really no simple um, uh, feat in actually making a vehicle and producing it at scale to the point that you can make money. That is actually both a skill, a science, and an art. Yeah? So disruptors could come in and disrupt, but disruptors also need to be able to learn the tricks of the trade 
and produce these vehicles at a, 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 a scale where they can actually um, make money. So I think it's, um, um, it, it's, it's a fair game in, in that sense. Disruption force, uh, will, uh, will force the incumbents to raise their game and the incumbents will also have their um, own advantages in that uh, they know how to produce vehicles at scale. I understand the point about how the technology is changing. Therefore, a lot of the components that were already there um, are not there anymore. Uh, and and it, it makes the production faster, which allows uh, startups to, uh, to enter the space with, with less barriers, as you say. But, but what about digitalization? And, and I'm thinking about the operating system in the cars. And in the past, I guess, I mean, up till now, um, the, the big uh, OS uh, companies, uh, primarily Google Android and Apple iOS, have been providing integrations right, between users, mobile phones, and the entertainment systems of the cars. But obviously, there is a push towards a finer uh, development of perhaps a car OS, right? That is managed by these uh, big tech companies. How is that being uh, seen or how is that being taken by the original equipment manufacturers? Hmm. I think uh, every manufacturer will have their own plans and their own worldview as to how they should do um, their digital platforms. And in, in this case, particularly, we're talking about the car's uh, operating system. So at the moment, what we're seeing out there in terms of the trends that we're observing, uh, there are some manufacturers who believe that this is not the space that they should enter. In other words, they should park their investments in developing electric vehicles that people truly love, electric vehicles that people uh, truly desire. Um, and leave the bit which is about um, infotainment, the bit which is about the operating system, all the digital bits in the car, to people who know best. And these are obviously the, the, the tech players. Um, so namely, uh, um, this is um, um, Google. Um, and Google obviously currently uh, has gone beyond um, the, um, the Android Auto uh, to Android Automotive Operating System and a suite of Google Automotive uh, services. Um, and some manufacturers, have, uh, this is very public, some manufacturers have already announced their partnership uh, with Google and they let Google um, become um, the uh, operating system of the vehicle and that's the Android Automotive OS. Yeah. Because they believe that this is what their customers want particularly customers who are using Android on their phones, right? So that's this, mm -hmm. I mentioned just now, remember about how they, they sync between your phone and your car. And then the user have this uh, seamless uh, experience between the phone and perhaps other screens at, their, uh, at home and also um, their car. But there are also other manufacturers who believe that actually it would be better for their customers to have their own unique user experience and, the, and that's the reason why for some of these manufacturers, they would prefer developing their own operating system, uh, sometimes in partnership with others, but nonetheless, it's still branded as their own as proprietary operating system, which um, they could roll out across all the models. And sometimes if it's developed at a group level, it could also be rolled out across all the brands within the same group, same parent group you know, for economies of scale purposes. And that provides for a more unique experience or relationship between the manufacturer and the user. Now, of course, either uh, approach will have its own advantages and disadvantages. Right? Uh, if we talk about, uh, let's say, the um, uh, Android Automotive uh, OS, it would be useful for some manufacturers who believe that's the way forward for their customers to actually concentrate their investments in other areas where they believe they can have a competitive advantage. For example, maybe batteries, maybe electric uh, drivetrain, or maybe even automated driving. Yeah. But for other manufacturers, they believe that the advantage is in maintaining that relationship with the customer 
so that the customer has a user experience that befits the, uh, the, the, the positioning of the brand. For example, if you are a premium brand, you may think that uh, you want to customize the user experience for your customers in a way that's truly unique and befits the, 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 the very um, uh, special aspects that you offer uh, your customers as part of your, your brand positioning. So you'd rather not collaborate with others um, and, and, and allow others to, um, to operate the OS within uh, your vehicles. You'd rather do it yourself. And of course, you have to invest more in doing that. But if you, if you do it right, um, you could actually um, um, uh, maintain that relationship with your customer and you could actually reap the benefits of a closer uh, customer uh, relationship. And that's great. And, and I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is because obviously we've seen uh, in other digital platforms, the orchestrator of the platform, in this case, it would be Google, right? They, they leverage those demand side economies of scale to then continue to uh, generate even more innovation on their own platform, right? So these would be third party applications that are added potentially in that Android Auto OS, right? So I guess the point you're raising is how much uh, do the original equipment manufacturers want to give away uh, to that uh, possibility versus focusing more on their core competencies and building competitive modes around mm. uh, those components that uh, are best at, right? Um, and and, yep. and this is... As you say, the strategy would vary depending on uh, the type of vehicle that is being offered, the type of other automated technologies and connected technologies that the manufacturers can offer to their clients, to their customers, mm. by means of building that um, uh, user experience. Yeah, just to add, you know, um, it really depends on how each manufacturer see their core competencies. Um, they do see their core competencies slightly differently, right? So if they feel that digi the digital platform, including the operating system, is part of their core competencies, then they may want to retain that and develop a proprietary OS. If they don't see it as their core competency, and they rather, as I said just now, park their efforts elsewhere, then they may partner with Google or others. At the moment, it's mainly Google. Right? But who knows, there may be others coming up in the, in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So it depends on each manufacturer's own strategies. Um, obviously, we are not privy to their, um, their strategies um, and they're entitled to, to make their own decisions. The second thing to mention is that even if they chose their own proprietary platform, there's nothing to stop them from partnering with the app developers for um, that layer of integration with the same apps that perhaps could be found on the Android platform. Yeah. And, and that's, that's true, even though there will be different standards and interfaces to follow and there are different costs for the developers. So it, it changes the, the way developers engage um, with these manufacturers. But I understand your point. This is something that you're not privy into. The, each, each manufacturer follows their own strategy. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the point. Let's move on to something else. Um, there has been a lot of debate as to whether we can deploy automated vehicles as a service mm. on demand, right? Without safety drivers across the mobility ecosystem from commercial trucks to public transport to delivery and logistics. And again, you mentioned some of these things at the very beginning where you talked about, you know, some uh, robots that even, you know, like Amazon's robots that uh, are deployed in different neighborhoods to deliver uh, parcels all the way to airports where you have other types of vehicles that enable uh, the parking of, of, of airplanes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so can you discuss the, the, the broad opportunities and challenges of automated mobility as a service? And, and here, maybe I want you to comment also on where we are in terms of automation, what are some of the challenges and, and which parts of automated mobility as a service can we see coming uh, faster than others? Mm. Mm. One of my pet subjects. 
Um, <laughs> so firstly, I'm glad you brought out that, that point, Panos, about, um, about automation. Um, and, and these could be actually, uh, this, could, this could operate in a number of settings. And one of them being, uh, as you mentioned, these, these commercial vehicles, goods delivery, so on and so forth, right? Um, because I mentioned at the beginning, you know, our, our worldview is shaped by what we see. Uh, and what we see uh, is, is principally um, those um, feeds uh, from the press or the media. And sometimes when we read the press um, um, or the papers or watch uh, um, news um, um, uh, bulletins, we, we, we're fed the idea of an automated vehicle must be this or this. But actually, there are three main types or main applications of automated vehicles, right? The first one is basically passenger cars, ordinary passenger cars that you and I could own. But these are fitted with automated driving features. For example, one of these features uh, could be a, a motorway pilot. Um, there, is, there is obviously a... a um, a generic term uh, to this currently for your audience or viewers uh, who are interested. Basically, it's called automated lane keeping system. And just because it's a regulated term, yeah, what it does is that um, it drives itself, keeps, it, keeps, uh, keeps itself within the lane uh, at uh, no more than 60 kilometers an hour to all intents and purposes, heavy traffic. Um, and then if uh, it comes to the limits of the environment, meaning traffic jam has dispersed, for example, it will hand control uh, back to you. And this is, this is one example uh, of, an, of an automated uh, driving feature. Another example is automated valet parking. So we are used to automated, uh, sorry, we're used to uh, valet parking. We, we know what it means. We drop the car off, somebody will park our car, right? Available at hotels, available at airports. But what is available currently um, in, in, in Stuttgart is that Stuttgart Airport, actually, is that you can um, drop your car off and the vehicle could go and park itself. Provided, of course, you have um, spec that feature in your, in your car and it's compatible with the infrastructure there. So these are passenger cars fitted with automated driving features. But the second application is when we start getting into the driverless type of application, which means that these vehicles are intended to be used without a driver. And potentially, it could also be built without steering wheels and pedals. This second application is principally passenger services. So you mentioned just now mobility as a service. So it could operate, for example, as automated ride hailing, automated shuttles or buses. Um, or it could just be demand responsive minibuses or minivans that can ferry uh, passengers. Right? The third application is also driverless. And these are automated vehicles operating as logistics, delivery, or industrial vehicles. So they could be, for example, vehicles that would deliver goods to your home, last mile delivery. I mentioned just now also middle mile. Uh, it could also be um, heavy goods vehicles plying the motorway, or it could be used off-road in ports and airports. So, for example, we have got a, a UK company that has actually trial airport dollies at Heathrow, and currently they have a contract with Changi Airport in Singapore to ferry the um, the um, uh, the bags, the luggage, uh, to um, to be loaded onto um, the aircraft. So the airport dollies. Yeah, there are lots of these um, applications. So basically, three main app overarching applications for automated driving. And then we can dive into the specific opportunities afforded by each of these applications. I think we, we have understood passenger cars very well. The opportunity is basically selling these features as optional fitments to customers. So for example, today, um, while I may not be at liberty to say uh, exactly how much it costs or in which particular brand, but it doesn't take your audience much effort just to Google it up and you can find that um, an automated driving feature is available in the German market. I'll give you a, given you a hint there for a price. 
So if you have a compatible vehicle, uh, you can pay um, um, an optional um, um, fitment. You can pay for an optional fitment of an automated driving uh, feature in your car. And that's the current business model of how this is um, being um, um, developed and dispatched. Now, of course, in the future, um, I think it is a possibility that some of these automated driving features could be made available to users of passenger cars, that's you and me, on a subscription basis. So this is yet another slightly different business model here. Or perhaps more accurately, it's the revenue model that is slightly going to be uh, uh, going to be slightly different, because users may feel that, for example, um, he or she knows is going to drive uh, long distances during the summer, maybe with the family on, on summer holidays. Therefore, for a more relaxing drive, having an automated feature purchase or subscribe to for just three months during the summer may be really appealing, and he or she doesn't really need it for the rest of the year. So you could take out a subscription of that service for three months. And then at the end of three months, you can choose to renew it or not. So that's an opportunity there in the passenger car segment, the first application. Now, automated driving in the other two applications where the vehicles are intended to be used as driverless, meaning without a driver. Yeah. So at the moment, what's the state of play? As I mentioned just now, it's not available in the UK yet, but automated ride hailing is already available in a few cities in the US. Now, how they do it is a matter for the, um, the states within the US. They, they have to go state by state, obviously, because of the way regulation works uh, in the US. Permission has to be uh, granted state by state. And then in terms of um, operating within the cities, the permit will have to come from the respective uh, cities um, as well. But it's happening there. And we also know that is also happening in one or two locations in the uh, in China, as commercially deployed driverless ride hailing services. Plenty of trials going on, some with or without a driver, but in terms of commercially operated ride hailing service, is available in a few locations um, in China, not yet in in the UK. But we can see that some of these um, applications in 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 um, in passenger services could have a market. Because from the operator's point of view, the most expensive element of running a service, obviously, is the driver. And we'll come to this. It's the same when it comes to third application on, on logistics and, and delivery. Right? Because when it, when it comes to logistics and delivery, it's not just the cost of a driver that influences the decision of um, operators. It's also about efficiency. Right. Two or three percent fuel savings, for example, for freight companies could be really huge. If you're applying long distance routes all the time on the motorway, two or three percent fuel saving is just immense yeah, in terms of uh, what it makes to your um, uh, bottom line. So the opportunities in logistics is that now you can start removing the driver either for part of the whole of the journey or in terms of off-road applications, greater productive efficiency could be had if you're actually automating part of the operations. So I mentioned just now airport dollies. Or we talk about quarries in the mining industry. Some of the most treacherous or dangerous tasks could be performed by automated vehicles. So um, we know for a fact that uh, automated loaders have already been used in, in quarries um, in Australia, um, for example. Now, scale of the opportunity. I go back to the report that we uh, published uh, recently. It shows that basically in terms of when we sized up these markets, it shows that in terms of the largest markets, these could be found in on-road logistics, which is basically first mile, middle mile, last mile, or just simply long distance logistics, ferrying goods, ferrying components and parts from one place to another or delivering goods. And the size of the market in the UK alone by 2040 is about 15.2 billion pounds just for connected and automated technology in this particular 
uh, sector. And this is followed by on-road passenger services. I mentioned ride hailing, shuttles, buses, you know? And that's about 3.7 billion pounds by 2040. And then comes off, uh, sorry, a, a, a back of part of it. It's come off-road um, logistics, which is basically airports, ports, mines, quarries, farms. That's 2.3 uh, billion pounds by uh, 2040. That's the size of the market. However, if you're asking me, what's the earliest take-up opportunity? In which of these sectors might we see the technology being applied, being adopted first? And the answer is, it's quite likely to be in the off-road sectors, just because that the regulations um, um, that's, that um, um, provide uh, the uh, overarching governance for the off-road sectors are not the same as the road traffic regulations. And it's easier to deploy off-road because there are fewer human beings. So if we are talking about mines and quarries, agriculture, farmland, these are uh, perfect places to deploy some of these applications. So what we've found is that mining and agriculture are the two markets where there are the earliest uh, take-up opportunities. However, if you're asking me about the steepest uptake, yeah, which is basically that curve of uptake, which sector might embrace it the quickest once it starts adopting the technology? Again, these are the off-road sectors. Mining is one and off-road logistics is another. So there are some opportunities in these various sectors. It depends how you actually look at your, um, your, your use cases and which you think could be best automated and uh, the, uh, the cost savings that could be had as a result of automating these. That's uh, great, David. And and what I uh, what I take from uh, this uh, very brief analysis, and I'm sure you have you have more uh, around this on in, in in your reports, is this idea of deploying automation on demand via subscription or other pricing model over the cloud when it is needed, right? I mean, and uh, I mean, think about your example of the quarries and uh, the, the farmlands and uh, other off-road locations where, as you say, because of less safety concerns, there's no humans around, uh, it's easier to deploy. You could have possibly one uh, provider of uh, services, whether that's, uh, you know, in agriculture, buying automated service as a streaming package. I mean, the, the, and that's not science fiction. It sounds like this is something that you could possibly have if, of course, the vehicle is fitted with the right hardware, the sensors, et cetera, that would allow it uh, to perform those automated activities. Uh, just to clarify, the, the time-bound subscription model, um, at the moment, what we're seeing is that it's a possibility in a passenger car segment. So the first application, the first of the three, yeah? So passenger car application, primarily because it's happening. Now, it's not it's not um, automated vehicles, but I can tell you in case your audience might be interested. Assisted driving features today, some of these are already available as uh, time-bound subscription services. So you can take out, for example, a hands-free, eyes-on assistance uh, package whereby you still have to pay attention to the road, but it actually steers, accelerates, and brakes for you uh, for a fee, for a monthly fee. You can, you can renew it um, from month to month, if you wish, or you can buy a longer, longer term subscription. But that's passenger cars. What we are not seeing yet, or we don't know yet, is whether this particular model might also trickle into some of the other sectors, particularly some of those off-road sectors like mining or agriculture. That is unclear, that is uncertain. It really depends on how this area develops, but, oh, but primarily because the, the technology is still is very much in its infancy. It is already deployed in mines in, in, in Australia, for example. Um, but at the moment, to our knowledge, that's not on a subscription-based model. That's uh, on a permanently fitted um, 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 uh, arrangement. 
into these mining loaders. No, I understand that point, but I, I, I mean, what I meant was, I can see that the fu where the future is going, right? I mean, you could definitely see, given that this time-bound model is already being deployed for some types of automation, right? Uh, you could see how this could also apply in the future um, in these other sectors. Mm. And that's very exciting because it creates all sorts of opportunities for um, third parties to come in. And again, uh, new business models to be developed. Yes, absolutely. I think the most important thing is to keep an open mind as to how things may develop in the future. And that's how um, we can spawn new innovations. Exactly. Okay, so I now want to switch gears and focus on the topic of electric and hydrogen uh, vehicles. Um, mm. and, and I have read the, 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 rate, uh, the Race uh, to Zero uh, report from SMMT uh, that outlines a lot of the strengths of the electric and hydrogen vehicle supply chain within the UK mm -hmm. um, and also the strong commitment of the government um, towards net zero productivity. So can you discuss some of the, um, the broad opportunities and challenges um, of transforming the manufacturing of vehicles into a more green uh, future? Right. If we approach this from an industrial perspective, which is basically manufacturing and, and supply chain, as you uh, indicated, then we have to understand firstly that the, the transformation of the industry in the UK is a transition. It's never going to be an overnight switch because industry is sticky. Even the market itself, right? We always say that two sides of the same coin. One is the market. And the other one is the industry. One is what you put on the market to sell. And the other one is what you make in order to sell, right? Two sides of the same coin. Even the market will require a transitional period, which is why we are looking at all the way out to 2030 and 2035. But the industry is even stickier because if you've set up a plant in the UK to manufacture internal combustion engines, or internal combustion engine vehicles, then it takes longer to actually switch over, not just because of retooling the plant, but because of your supply chain and the new components that you need as a result of this transition, as a result of moving away from internal combustion engines. Right Now, you may recall I mentioned just now that there are fewer moving parts, fewer components generally in an electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle. But quite a lot of this new expertise and these new components needed to be developed here in the UK. As things stand at the moment, right, we have one um, gigafactory in the UK. And that's in the in the northeast. That's public knowledge. Thankfully, in the last few months, um, that was terrific news. Um, we've got commitment for another gigafactory in the in the southwest that will be built in the next few years. But we need more of these. So you see, transitioning to electrification is obviously necessary because it is for the good of everyone. It's for the good of the planet. And we need to do that in order to uh, meet our net zero ambitions. But it has to have a strategy whereby we have to set out all the conditions that are required. And if these conditions don't fall into place, it could be very difficult for industry to transition seamlessly. But what are some of these conditions? I mentioned just now the supply chain. The battery is only one of them. A lot of media attention is trained on batteries and gigafactories because it's, it's easier for the public to understand, oh, that's a huge battery factory here. And that's what we need. But actually, what industry needs, besides a battery gigafactory that produces the battery packs, is also cell production and the battery material supply chain that surrounds it. And what I mean by that is we are looking at things like battery materials, critical minerals, refining and processing, leading all the way to active materials, whether it's cathode or anode active materials production. Mm -hmm. And that will go into, obviously, the cells and the cells 
the modules. Uh, those who skip the modules will go straight into pack assembly. The idea of having just battery factory is not enough because we need all these conditions uh, that is actually upstream conditions yeah, that, that precede the gigafactory to fall in place. So that's, that's one bit. The other condition is very much about green energy. And we always have this idea that, ah, yes, if it emits nothing at the tailpipe, then that's good because we improve air quality and we save a lot of carbon emissions. That's absolutely true. So electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles, even hydrogen fuel cell vehicles emit uh, um, no carbon uh, at the tailpipe. However, we often forget that what we need to do is also to ensure that our power generation is equally green. Because there's no point producing the batteries or charging an electric vehicle using brown electricity. Right? We need to ensure green electricity is used to produce the green battery packs and green electricity is used to charge green vehicles. So decarbonizing our power generation at scale and at pace is really an important challenge going forward. So the transition actually has got quite a number of challenges. However, as we stated, uh, stated in our Race to Zero report, um, there are plenty of opportunities because we have uh, a long tradition of world-class uh, engineering in, in the UK. Uh, skilled, productive, and flexible workforce. And we have a supportive environment whereby the government works with industri uh, industry uh, to actually chart a path. And of course, to be fair, um, we've got uh, government being um, uh, very attentive to this, um, uh, providing uh, a number of packages to support the transition, uh, namely the Automotive Transformation Fund, uh, which uh, on the surface, it's a billion uh, pounds uh, uh, worth of support. Um, the challenge has only been made a little bit steeper because all of a sudden uh, you get the US uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which provides some $369 billion worth of support and blew everyone out of the water um, <laughs> as a result. Um, so we have to look at a very clever strategy as we stated in our report on how to de-risk private sector investment. The private sector would like to invest in electrification, in the supply chain, in manufacturing, but we need to look at how we can support the private sector, particularly in the light of protectionism from, from other countries, the US in, in, in particular. And the second thing is to ensure that we are competitive. And one of the ways to ensure we are competitive is to really um, um, ensure that rate tape is cut and permitting times are expedited and shortened, right? We cannot afford to wait for 10 years, for example, to connect a new plant or a new facility or a green project like, for example, wind farms to the grid. We need that to be much quicker. There's a running joke in the industry whereby we say it takes much, much, much longer to actually permit a wind farm than to build it. And then the third thing is so important to ensure that we have um, a global trading agreement that works for the UK, as well as engaging global resource diplomacy to, to secure these critical minerals that we need for the battery supply chain within the UK or the EU. Because at the moment, I think it's common knowledge, most of these critical minerals are mined in uh, South America or Africa and processed in China. We just have to ensure that we have the security of supply of ethically sourced uh, materials. That's great, and and thank you for um, uh, giving uh, a broad overview of the of the opportunities and challenges in this space. Uh, a lot to do, and but as you say, um, if the industry keeps competitive and stay, stays competitive with support from the government can avoid these protectionist uh, strategies that are being imposed uh, in other uh, countries um, with more resources and uh, including, uh, you know, uh, less uh, restrictions on trade agreements. So in closing, I would like to maybe give you the opportunity to say a few words about what 
SMMT um, is doing to, to, to help these stakeholders while working toward um, uh, this greener future? So we do a few things, um, principally because we are the voice of UK automotive. So we, re- we represent the interests and the views of UK automotive when we engage with government. And that's quite important because we work closely with government to develop the right strategies, to put the right plans in place, and as well as to have the right and optimal regulation to ensure that this transition is a success. Right? Because obviously, this um, um, in this space, it takes collaboration. Yeah, for a win-win situation, we need collaboration. Collaboration between the industry and government, and also from time to time, depending on the issues, we bring other sectors in. So multi-sector collaboration is absolutely pivotal. So for example, you, you mentioned just now in terms of um, the, the renewable energy, and this is where we have to work very closely uh, with the energy sector, both on the generation and the supply side, as well as the distribution side. Um, to transmission as well as local distribution um, uh, networks. So collaboration is one. That's what we do for the industry. We do on behalf uh, of our members, representing their views and bringing other industries together for collaboration, seeking a win-win solution. Uh, Another thing that we do is we create business opportunities uh, for for our members. And this is basically for for business development. Um, So... A lot of um, our members are looking for new partnership opportunities, uh, particularly in areas that are relatively new to them. So this could be obviously in uh, connected and automated um, mobility, or perhaps in uh, sourcing uh, or promoting some of the uh, new technologies within the electrification uh, space. So what we do is we try to uh, promote their businesses, both locally and abroad by matching them with interested suppliers or interested procurers. So creating these uh, business development um, opportunities. And I mentioned just now also some of our work abroad. We actually participate quite uh, actively every year um, in missions, both abroad as well as uh, domestically. So we do uh, go to a number of major events uh, every year, major trade shows, um, Uh, abroad and bring uh, the industry, bring our members to some of these events to promote uh, their products and their services. And for us, we generally fly the British flag um, and talking about uh, British automotive industry, trying to attract uh, foreign players to invest in the UK as well as to do business with the UK uh, automotive industry. And likewise, we also receive uh, foreign uh, trade missions coming to the UK um, and linking them up with uh, our members who are interested um, to um, to talk to some of these visiting uh, delegations, and apart from that, we from um, on a more general uh, perspective, uh, we support the industry in moving to a number of these technologies, including the new ones. And we mentioned just now at the beginning of our conversation about mobility as a service and some of these new mobility services. And I gave a few examples of crossing a few verticals. But you cannot cross these verticals unless you start develop partnerships with these verticals. And some 10 years ago, for example, um, partnerships with some of these tech sectors or adjacent sectors of energy was something that is not very common within UK automotive, or broadly speaking, even automotive globally. But increasingly, the lines are blurring between what's automotive and what's not. Right? So these partnerships are absolutely essential going forward, and we help um, uh, the UK automotive industry to develop these new partnerships for collaboration. And a good example here is actually in the, uh, in the energy space. So we foster this collaboration between, for example, the car manufacturers um, and also some of the energy suppliers uh, and the distribution network operators. When it comes to, for example, vehicle to grid um, trials and, and demonstrations, um, because that will essentially require collaboration that crisscrosses quite a few sectors, automotive, energy, and distribution. That's great, David. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was very enlightening uh, on, on many different fronts. Uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot about connected automated vehicles and also the 
the very uh, interesting opportunities and challenges in the electrification of cars, right? Um, um, really, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, and I hope we keep in touch. It's a pleasure, Panos. Thanks for having me.